Welcome to Capitol Dateline. We are in the historic chambers of the Florida Senate with our President of the Senate, Mike Herodopoulos from Melbourne, and our Speaker, Dean Cannon from Winter Park. Uh, welcome, gentlemen, Thank once you. again. Uh, Mr. President, we're seated in a unique spot uh, where everybody can hear everything. Tell us about that. Well, it's a special place. As you look around, of course, the former Senate presidents, we're looking at the folks who literally built Florida. And it's an exciting time. It's a challenging time. But I think you have to be inspired whenever you're here. You know that you literally have the opportunity to change the destiny of the state. I'm just really glad to have a partner, Dean Cannon, and, of course, our new governor, Rick Scott, who are dedicated to moving the state forward. Mr. Speaker, um, every session has its rhythm, it seems. Uh, this one is really unique because of its furious pace. A lot has happened in the first several weeks in terms of major legislation getting to the floor of the House and of the Senate. Tell us why that's happening and uh, what are a couple of major pieces that have hit the floor of the House and why they got there so fast. And Mr. President, I'd like to hear the same sort of uh, answer from you. I, I think the foundation for that has was laid really by uh, President Herodopoulos and I having a great friendship and working relationship before coming in to the roles of Senate President and Speaker. Uh, not only have these first few weeks of session been remarkable, I think, for the uh, the boldness of the measures, the seriousness of the issues, and the quality of the debate, but if you think about it, the day we were sworn in, back in uh, organization session in November, you know, we did seven veto overrides, a memorial, I mean, we, we hit the ground running and we haven't slowed down since. Um, I really, again, am, am grateful that, that President Herodopoulos got going early on teacher quality in the Senate, sent that down yesterday, uh, or this week in the House, we took up and passed out uh, I think an even better bill of merit pay and allowing us to pay our best teachers more. I was excited that uh, this year, unlike last year, uh, Governor Scott was in the rotunda to congratulate us rather than to uh, veto it as our prior governor did. Uh, we also took up unemployment compensation, things like that. And so I think that the, the folks back home should be proud that both the Senate and the House are working hard to grapple with the tough issues, uh, not be distracted by minutia or changing the state pie, we're trying to get the economy going again, get people back to work and work together. Mr. President, uh, in the, let's say, the selection of issues to hit the Senate floor and the House floor, is there a message uh, in the aggregate uh, in terms of the selection of those issues? Well, I think the most important thing is keeping your campaign promises. I think that's what's so refreshing about Governor Rick Scott. He campaigned as a conservative. He is governing as a conservative, and he's been very aggressive about cutting back spending as opposed to growing spending, which is happening in Washington. Our agenda was clear. We really felt strongly that what is now known as Obamacare was not a good idea. And so one of the first bills, actually the first bill we passed in the Florida Senate, was a constitutional amendment to strike portions of it that re required you to actually purchase health insurance that you might not be able to afford. Uh, second, of course, the teacher quality bill that the Speaker talks about, we passed it off the floor of the Senate in a bipartisan fashion. Just in, this, in week two, we also went forward and moved forward with tort reform. And also in week two, we've really thought a good idea is known as smart cap. It says that by constitutional amendment, that government spending should never grow faster than family income. And when times are good, you put some money aside. So when the economy slips like it always does, the business cycle, there's reserves in place. I call it the Old Testament option, where you don't eat all your corn uh, it's in times of good. So in times of bad, you don't have to eat sand. Let, let's talk about that smart cap. Uh, First of all, we already have a cap, correct? What is that based on, the current cap? Well, not much, because it didn't work. Even in when the times were good, we never even reached that cap. And I think everyone recognized that the people overspent in the past. It's a very common sense idea. Again, it's let's make sure that we don't overspend when times are good, because when you overspend, you take money out of the private sector's hands. More importantly, you take money out of people's pockets. We don't want to see that happen. We want to put reserves aside and always have flexibility, of course, but the idea is not overspend when times are good. Candidly, I've been working on this plan for 11 years. I actually passed it when I was a freshman in the House. It was always the Senate holding up, and I think it's a symbol of where the Senate is today. It is much more fiscally conservative. That was our goal, and we've moved in that direction on health care reform, on teachers, uh, helping teachers get paid more in the long run, and finally the idea of smart cap. It is a fiscally conservative place because at the end of the day, the way you create jobs is by freeing up the private sector and encouraging economic as well as educational development. If I may, though, because I think this is an important idea, and you've been working on it a long time. The smart cap, how would it work? What, what 
you know, what's the formula? Sure. The way it works is that in a given year, you only can increase the spending by as much as a family is increasing their spending. No more. By their income. And so let's say that their income increased by 3%. We could only spend 3% more. Any other additional revenues that came into the government will go into what we call a rainy day fund. And they'll stay there. And it will not be used unless we have an economic downturn. If we're able to build up a 10% reserve, we'll automatically provide tax relief. Again, putting it back into the economy. That's the kind of common sense that we think works. We think the idea is that you don't spend all your money just because you happen to have a good year. Put some in the bank because, again, this is a business cycle, and we all uh, really recognize that. And you have the flexibility. God forbid there's a hurricane. You can draw on those reserves. But, we're, again, we're putting a higher threshold so that we don't overspend when times are good. That's all we're trying to do. And, again, the voters, not elected officials, but the voters will have the final say in November 2012. Mr. Speaker, I notice you're nodding uh, like you are in agreement. Is this an idea that uh, will likely find approval in the House? Yes, yeah, certainly there's broad support for the concept in the House. And I also want to compliment something that uh, President Herodopoulos in the Senate did, which is uh, tried to adjust the concept from an inflexible cap to, I think, what, what he and I refer to as a smart cap. The House has always has a slightly different approach but the concept we support wholeheartedly, and I have pretty good optimism that that will get done before the end of session. I guess the only criticism in general that I've read is that what you mentioned, Mr. President, is that if we have a severe catastrophe uh, or natural catastrophe, that because there are extraordinary votes required in the current concept uh, in order to lift the cap, that there might not be an adequate uh, response time to address those those. Uh, kinds of catastrophes. What's your response to that? It's a, it's a flexible cap. It provides for those opportunities for a supermajority vote. But again, we're trying to provide stability for taxpayers for a change. They need to have that stability that in order to increase spending beyond their ability to pay for it, there should be a supermajority. And I think we've shown already in the last few years when there are difficult times, there is a supermajority of voters, whether it be in the Senate or the House, in our case, 24 or 27 votes, depending on the circumstance. But that's common sense. You want to provide stability. I mean, that's, that's how we're really going to create jobs. This is why Dean has done such a great job in looking at Medicaid reform. He's done a great job in looking at the smart cap proposal. It's providing that stability. When you offer stability, whether it be to a family when the child's growing up or a business, knowing that finally the government's not going to extract more than they can afford, they're going to grow jobs and opportunities as opposed to wondering what's going to happen. That's when capital stays on the sidelines and not in the economy. Mr. Speaker, um, obviously this uh, session is, is about overarchingly the budget. And uh, as you're looking forward now, um, are you really beginning to get clearer estimates of what the problem is than you had, say, at the beginning of the session, what the problem is right now? Well, actually, not necessarily. I think uh, if there is an upside to the seriousness of the budget shortfall, it's that it, it is not a secret to anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, President Herodopoulos and I saw this, talked about it even last year, that, boy, we will be the first presiding officers who will actually have to confront the economic meltdown of 08 because there was the federal stimulus money sort of masking uh, the real impact of that uh, economic uh, recession for two years. So we're aware of it. We're, we're just as aware as we've always been. Uh, unfortunately, I think when the Revenue Estimating Committee meets uh, shortly, uh, the fear is that it may actually adjust our shortfall to make it slightly larger. But, but again, we've, we, we're prepared to confront it as leaders, uh, make tough decisions, and get the budget done. And in a good way, because we have on high unemployment, because we have uh, pretty severe economic news, I think it's not a surprise to anybody. Most of the folks that have been coming to see us, and I would expect it's the same in the Senate, they recognize that these are dire times. And, and just like Mike said, you know, they're going to have, you know, government has to live within its means. The reason we have less dollars is because the moms and dads and the businesses of Florida had less money to send to Tallahassee. So we need to reduce spending, and that's what we intend to do. Follow up question, and I'd like to hear from both of you on this. Governor Scott seems to be reaching out to the Tea Party uh, to get support for his budget recommendations, which would include, of course, tax cuts on top of uh, trying to deal with the issues you are, um, and to try to get their support to speak to the legislature, saying, please uh, support my proposals for tax cuts. Uh, do, you, do you think it's realistic, in light of what you were just talking about, the revenue estimates and so forth, to um, really 
think that there could be tax cuts on top of the budget cuts, Mr. Speaker? Uh, I'd say this. I said before the governor rolled out his budget proposal, uh, what I said then is still true today, and that is that's going to be very difficult. Uh, I also think that nobody is as big a fan of tax cuts and tax reductions as President Herodopoulos and I. Uh, we worked together back in 2007 to aggressively cut property taxes, cutting over $11 billion in, in potential property tax increases. So I think certainly on behalf of the House, and I'll let uh, President Herodopoulos talk about the Senate, we've got the appetite to cut taxes. But the first and most important goal is balance the budget by cutting spending. And if we cut, and I believe we will, $4.6 or more billion dollars in government spending, that's a victory. If we can lay the foundation or make some progress on some tax cuts, we've got a great appetite for that too. But that's really up to the work of uh, Chair Alexander in the Senate and Chair Grimsley, our two appropriations chairmen, to hash out the, the details of that once we begin uh, the budget process very soon. Last word, Mr. President. I, I think Dean put it very well. Again, it's always been a spending problem in government. It's why we have a smart cap. We don't want to overspend when times are good, and obviously when times are bad, you got to cut back. This is a common sense approach that we've taken. That we're doing what businesses and families are doing right now. We're reducing our spending, and that's what we're going to focus on first and foremost. Once we've reached that magic number that the speaker talked about, then we'll potentially look at tax relief. But first and foremost, we need to lead by example, make the tough calls like businesses and families are making right now.